Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Suranya, for doing this. You are so sweet and so amazing. And I had my uh, photos from India pop up on my timeline on Facebook, reminded me of what a great trip I had. Very interesting, long, long ride, 26 hours, I think, to get there. The trip to the Taj Mahal, everything was beautiful. And I so enjoyed uh, participating in the event as well. The film was amazing. And it does, uh, I've had a circulated it a lot here in the US, even though it's of course subtitled here. Uh, we had, I had a little bit of resistance, but um, it's gotten around a lot and we've had a lot of other things happening here. So, you know, in America, we always say, what do you want first, the good news or the bad news? And uh, that means at least there is some news. So I'm going to start with a little bit of good news and then I'm going to tell you all of the bad news. So first of all, uh, my grassroots organization, the Family Forward Project, which uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, we just use a simple uh, Facebook platform. It is Family Forward Project. It is a group. It is a public group. Uh, we also have Family Forward and then every state. So Family Forward Indiana, Family Forward Wisconsin, where we really try to direct parents to get into those individual groups where we have some people organizing some chat rooms. Uh, we are continuing to grow and the Family Forward Project is continuing its trips to Washington, D.C. We go about three or four times a year and we have since 2015. We are what I call the ragtag um, citizen lobbyist. We take always try to take with us some people who have current stories of the horrendous things that have happened to them with the CPS organizations in their particular states. And we know that some people are scared to go. Some people are uh, scared to speak up, but we just encourage uh, people to go. And then we have kind of a core group of about six people who've been doing it now for about six years. I mean, and we get up there, we march the halls, we make appointments, we sit down and talk. So in our work through uh, our federal work, we have a proposed bill. In, in America, the funding comes through CAPTA, which is the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, which is technically expired. Uh, so technically it no longer exists. However, they're continuing to draw funds on that. Uh, what, so we went in and we tried to work with a rewrite of the CAPTA bill. And we have this political problem <laughs> going on right now at the federal level where the Democrats and the Republicans are so distracted. And so there's such narrow margins and they're fighting over so many things that are just ancillary to this, like, you know, borders and Israel and all those things. It's hard to get them to focus on children, believe it or not, in their own country. So we do have a sponsor for this bill. We are actively pursuing co-sponsors and we're going up again in May. Uh, we've got, we've had good reception. A lot of people we've educated on what the real problems are in the homeland. You know, we continue to make a little progress, you know, in Washington, a lot of that is run by legislative aides who are very young, but they do have to educate their um, uh, their congressperson, a, a, a senator in Georgia named John Ossoff had a big uh, uh, congressional hearing in November or October. And he, it was awesome. He kind of took it to heart to decide he was going to help make some changes. But then he's also kind of gotten distracted. So it's a constant perpetual battlefield here. Uh, also, good news is the Tennessee Supreme Court came out with this opinion called N. Ray Marcus E. If anybody wants to look at it internationally, you can, um, I'm sure, Google it. It pops up, M-A-R-K-U-S, Marcus E. And in that case, which I had participated in, it was a child where there was medical, complex medical conditions. This is one of those fractured rib cases. Uh, the the They had a difficult time finding an expert for the parents, but they did go to court. There was a finding of severe abuse, but the problem was, of course, they could not identify that the parents had really injured the child. They did have their child removed. This was in 2015. It gets all the way up to the Tennessee Supreme Court. We get an excellent opinion from the Tennessee Supreme Court that says that they the state did not prove the knowing element of failure to protect. So they have to, because the mother had taken the child to the doctor multiple times, they had always cared for the child, but because the state did not prove knowing that the, the termination of parental rights was reversed, which is excellent, okay? But that's not the bad news. I'll get to that in a minute. 
The next good news item is that all the retaliation that was done against me has finally been, well, not all of it. I'm still battling some retaliation, but the, the fake criminal charges that they brought against me to try to shut me down have been reversed or dismissed. So I still have battles uh, at a professional level. Um, you know, the systems don't like me around here because of my aggressiveness. Also, I want to encourage anybody who uses social media to get on LinkedIn. There are a lot of professionals who are across the United States who are using LinkedIn to try to uh, create some cohesiveness and share the stories, the news articles, et cetera. I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, there are several other advocates there. So that's kind of the good news. All right, so let's talk about the bad news. The bad news is the Marcus E. case. Uh, that uh, Supreme Court opinion was in May 2023, and that mother who was separated from her child nine years ago has still not seen her child. They have asked the courts to reinstate visitation, to try to do reunification, and they have continued created roadblocks. And then this, this humongous state agency that is trying to control the lives of people went to the General Assembly, our legislative body, and said, we need a new law that says that if there is any type of finding of severe abuse or this type of medical complexity with a child, that the parent has to prove they're innocent and had nothing to do with it before they can see their child. So in other words, they have, they have totally reversed the burden of proof, making a parent prove their they, uh, by clear and convincing evidence, by the way, which is a really high standard, that they can be excluded as a perpetrator. This is entirely unconstitutional. The United States Constitution says that the state has to prove the unfitness of the parent. You know, but again, it takes a constitutional attorney to take that all the way up and challenge it again. It's a constant battlefield in the in the court uh, system. Come inside the kitchen, not be. Okay. Okay. So to go on, uh, so bad news. Uh, the other bad news is, uh, I our family forward group watches state legislation all over the country. We're watching what's happened. We have some really strong advocates in several states. Right now, we have this horrible situation where the gender identity crisis is being used to remove children from parents. Uh, in Montana, they removed a child from the parents and shipped the child to Canada because the parents, because at school, they had endorsed this gender transition, gender, you know, claiming different identities. And the child was removed from the parents and shipped to the other parent in Canada who would endorse the child's uh, desire to change their gender identity. The same thing has happened in the state of Texas. This is very, very concerning and and you know whether you however you feel about the gender issues this is just the tip of the iceberg it will be used for anything it can be used i mean this they get they get a little you know it's like the camel who gets his foot in the door if they get an inch inside the tent it will expand and explode and that will explode to what if you and your child have different religious preferences i mean who knows where it's going to go so this is also this is crazy concerning to me in tennessee I'm going to tell you about three things uh, that we have done, which codifies bad news for parents. In other words, it puts into law bad news for parents. And I have gone down to the General Assembly. I have spoken now about five times this year. I'm going down again today at one o'clock to speak against another bill. We only get three minutes to speak. They are trying to shut up those who are trying to speak. They keep, you know, coming up with excuses why we can't speak. You know, fortunately in Tennessee, we did get a law passed last year that said that if a government body had a public meeting, they had to provide a time for public comments. But then the law says that they can set reasonable restrictions. And so now, now they're trying to set reasonable restrictions of saying, oh, we're just too busy. We don't have time for public comments. So it's a real struggle. But I embrace that opportunity anytime I can with a public body, because that's when, whether or not they like me or not, whether or not they try to shut me up or not, whether or not they try to criminalize me or not, 
That is the opportunity that I have that they have to listen to me. Now, it's really so bad that during one hearing, two people in the committee got up and left the room because they didn't want to hear it, okay? This is horrible. This is what's happening. They just do not want to hear the truth. I don't know who who's, I don't know where the money is coming from. We could have a whole nother conversation about the money that's behind all of this. I heard that discussion already a little bit this morning. In the U.S., we have a lot of private equity companies that are trying to control the troubled teen industry, trying to control residential groups group homes. We had a great Netflix movie come out. If you have not seen it, it's called The Program. It's about the troubled teen industry in the United States and how horrible that situation was and actually continues to be. In spite of the Family First Act, which required the states to close their group homes, they are continuing to try to shift to the institutionalization of children. All right, so let me tell you about a couple of things that happened specifically. In Tennessee, we had what they called politely the parental rights bill, or I think the formal not name was the Family Rights and Responsibilities Act of 2024 for Tennessee. I went and I spoke against this bill. This sounds like a great thing. However, Although it states at the commencement of the bill that there is a fundamental right to parent children in the United States, it has the word unless seven times. It has all kinds of exceptions. And basically, it gives uh, it's a slippery slope. If you know about, you know, logic and, and understanding logic, it's a true slippery, slippery slope. Because under the unlesses, it includes an unless there is a law enforcement interaction, okay? It doesn't say there has to be probable cause of a crime. It doesn't have to say there has to be probable cause of abuse or neglect. It just says if there's a law enforcement interaction. If there's a law enforcement interaction, they will be able to to stop your child anywhere and interrogate them without parental knowledge or consent. And then there are several other exceptions as well. There is also an exception called the blanket consent. Now, this if a parent signs a blanket consent, that just waives basically all of their parental rights. Now, people are going like, well, who would be stupid enough to sign a blanket consent? Well, here's what's going to happen. There are attorneys all over this country who, repre who represent educational organizations, uh, medical organizations, and they will bury a blanket consent in every form that is pu pushed in front of a parent in which their child is engaging with that entity, okay? So whether it's a school, whether it's getting medical treatment, dental treatment, I mean, people are going to be so scared of this bill they're going to put in a blanket consent. And the reason there's some anxiety about it, because the bill also creates a cause of action or an opportunity for a parent to sue if somebody vi violates their parental rights. But here's the truth of the matter. As an attorney who worked for three decades in these courts, no attorney's going to take this type of case. They're not going to take it because there's all kinds of exceptions. There's all kind of what for, but for, unless, except. So nobody's going to try to take a case in which there's a violation of parental rights. All right. And then I've already told you about the shifting burden of proof for parents if there is a quote unquote severe abuse finding. And that severe abuse finding can be so many different things, which includes the shaken baby theory, which has now been debunked, but is still in Tennessee law. It also includes what's called broken or fractured ribs, which we now know that children with metabolic bone disease can suffer fractured ribs with in incidental handling. So if there's any type of finding of severe abuse, then the parents have to exclude themselves as a perpetrator by clear and convincing evidence. The other thing that severe abuse includes is the state agency's ability to bring in, to hire, pay, and bring in a psychologist or psychiatrist to say that the child may suffer some type of severe psychological damage in the future. Okay, it's total predictive negligence and predictive abuse, which is outrageous because they can pay people to say it. And I've experienced that. I've heard people, these psychologists get up and say, well, because the child was neglected in the home, they are sure, certain to experience some type of psychological, severe psychological event sometime in the future, although they don't know when. All right. And the last one, the one that I'm going downtown to talk about today, and then I will close out. And I appreciate everybody's attention. But the, the last one... <laughs> I can, I can hardly catch my breath to talk about 
is where Tennessee is codifying or making legal with taxpayer dollars what they call quote unquote opportunity charter schools. Okay, opportunity is sort of the buzzword here. These quote unquote opportunity charter schools are to be residential schools for children who are considered at risk. And these are children between the ages of uh, I think eighth grade and 12th grade. So the way they identify at risk, I, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to pull this up here just a second and tell you about this because it is so frightening. I've got a whole bunch of stuff buried here on my thing to talk about, but at risk children can be considered. All right, an at-risk child can be any child who has um, dropped out of school without a high school diploma, okay? <laughs> it can be any child who was adjudicated as delinquent or is awaiting adjudication, which means they've not even been adjudicated yet. Uh, any student who's previously been detained or incarcerated in a juvenile detention center. Now, you may think that that is like hardcore juvenile criminals, but it is not. I mean, if a child who gets picked up because they're truant, they've run away, they've left school, they're going to be taken to the juvenile detention center. And so, so even though they've never been found to be a criminal, they could face that um, they could face that category. A child who's been retained twice uh, in any grade K through eight, or, or they are one year behind in their high school credits and they're not going to gradu graduate with their student cohort. Again, pretty risky. If they're chronically absent, if they're pregnant or they're a parent, if they have a substance abuse issue, or if the student has experienced abuse or neglect. Now, because the standards are so low for abuse or neglect, this could be a whole plethora of children. So we have all of these children now, they're making it sound like in this bill that this is a voluntary enrollment program. However, what we know is once they get this program up, which is basically an internment camp for teenagers, that they will then make this an involuntary process and we will be institutionalizing any child who has an at-risk issue. Uh, Connie, that was fascinating and you raised so many important issues and, um, uh, you know, I, I mean, we're going to carry on this discussion. Uh, I'll, I'll take down points and uh, a lot of your experience is what so many of us have seen in other jurisdictions as well. We've got a shaken baby expert uh, on this call.